Hello, everyone. I would like to welcome you to our... Oh, my name is Alita Williams, and I am the president of the Rotary Club of Chicago. And I would like to welcome you to our 5,679th meeting of the Rotary Club. And with that, um, I would like to, we're going to do some announcements first so that everyone can get their lunches really quickly. And so coming up on every, on every table, there's a flyer for next Tuesday, which is World Polio Day. And we are having a wonderful speaker here that next week, Ina Pickney, also known as the Breakfast Queen. But she is also a polio survivor. And she is working with, the Rotary, with Rotary International about how polio survivors are thriving in the world. And so she will be here to speak next week. Afterwards, at 5 o'clock over at Berghoff's, we're having a wonderful Polio Day event. I guess pints for polio. So, <laughs> so we're having a great German speaker, German band that's coming to play. It's going to be a really fun event in which we also raise money to help um, vaccinate for polio and help get rid of polio in the world. And then next Saturday, we are going to be over on Michigan Avenue by the Apple Store just telling people about Rotary and how and how to help in polio. So if anyone would love to be a part of any of those events, that would be wonderful. And with that, we will if you all have questions at the end of the at the end of the speakers, please understand we want to be succinct. One question per person. If you are on our Zoom and if you have questions, please feel free to put those into the chat and we will get to those when we get done with the in per, with in the room speak um, questions. And then with that, I would like to bring up Patrick Burns. He's going to do our thought of the day and introduce our speaker. Uh, well, thank you, Alita. I think uh, thought of the day comes first, right? OK. All right, so I thought a good thought today uh, is uh, uh, concerns just displaced people, people who aren't at their own home. And it seems to be a lot of that all around the world today. So, so uh, my nephew and godson is an Episcopal priest in Pennsylvania. And I called him yesterday. I said, I got to do this and blah, blah, blah. And he helped me. So I want to read this thought uh, from uh, Eric, Eric Bond. Together, may our hearts well with compassion for all persons and peoples who endure the traumas and challenges of displacement and loss. For all who struggle through transitions and strive for new beginnings. Let us play what parts we can to extend care and support to neighbors in need of help and hope and home until all who seek refuge may share safety, belonging, freedom, connection, community. Amen. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker uh, from a Safe Place. Pat Davenport is the executive director of A Safe Place, an organization in Lake County devoted to assisting survivors of domestic abuse. A Safe Place is the sole provider of services exclusively addressing domestic violence and human trafficking in Lake County, Illinois. Through multifaceted programs, they assist victims in transforming their lives after violence, prevent future abuse by addressing the root cause through abuser intervention programs, and educate the community about domestic violence and human trafficking and how we can all be involved in ending them. Pat, please welcome, please join me in welcoming Pat. Well, and I would like to give a special thanks to Patrick for making the connection uh, with this club and allowing us to be here. And it's a great honor to present to you today. Um, I am going to try to learn how to use this clicker here uh, to make sure that I am passing it through as I need to. Uh, so a safe place, as Patrick mentioned, um, it is the only provider 
in Lake County that is solely dedicated to providing domestic violence and human trafficking. We have been around for about 45 years. Uh, we just had our 45th birthday and we celebrated it with a tremendous gala actually last Saturday. And um, we started as a domestic violence organization. And up until about eight years ago, we saw that clients that were coming to us were really talking about domestic violence when they came in. But as they started to trust us more, we were discovering that they were really were human traffic victims. And our reason for being here is twofold. One is that domestic violence and human trafficking happens everywhere. And it happens to anyone. It happens to the young, to the old, and anyone in between, to the wealthy, to the poor, the middle class, you name it. It does not forgive at all as to who it affects and impacts. Um, what you see here is basically our administrative office. We had very humble beginnings. Uh, in 1987, we were given an old Victorian home that was rehab and we could only house about eight to 10 families. Fast forward now, 45 years later, we are in 16 locations throughout Lake County. And I was just talking at my table with Judge Virginia when I was mentioning to her that in November or December, we will be opening up our first ever human trafficking shelter. And if you think that there is no connection between let's say Chicago and Lake, her and I were talking about the highway, you know, that goes all the way from Chicago to Milwaukee and we're right in the middle. And we see everything going, you know, through that corridor with human trafficking. Um, our mission is that we want to be the leading organization to end domestic violence and there are very few organizations in the state of Illinois and I will risk to say actually in the United States that provides the kind of comprehensive services that we provide and the reason why is that people don't get to this point um, overnight. It happens through a process. So basically, our services will help individuals at whatever stage they are at in how they need services. And um, in case you're wondering about the need and whether it is really needed or not that organizations like ours exist, there is one in every three women that are impacted by domestic violence and one out of every seven men. We actually, about 80% of our clients are females and 20% of them are male. The state average for males is 12%. So we actually have a very high ratio. Uh, working with men is very different than working with a woman victim. Um, they don't usually come forth. There's a lot of embarrassment that happens. And uh, we have been training and working with our staff to make sure that they know how to work with male victims. Um, over 10 million children have witnessed domestic violence and we see an intersection. So 80% of our clients that come in may come in because of domestic violence, but 80% of them have been sexually abused by the intimate partner very often in front of their children where they are being raped. So you can see the impact that happens with kids like that. Um, about 70% of the kids are abused or neglected. And now we have really seen about 20% of our clients are traffic clients. Um, in terms of, if you're wondering, you know, why do we even bother, right, with domestic violence services? And uh, it is five times more common than the most communicable disease. So think about it, what happened with COVID and how rampant that spread. Take that concept and transfer it into the world of domestic violence. Um, if you only think some people out there say, well, you know what happens behind closed doors, happens behind closed doors, and we should not be questioning anything because it doesn't impact anyone. 
that could be farther from the truth. It impacts employers. And basically, the only study that has been made that is actually available was in 2003. Otherwise, I would have more updated information for you. But basically, we learned through that process that the cost is about 8.3 billion per year in healthcare cost. That translates into money for businesses in terms of the premiums that are being paid for your employees. Um, the annual cost of productivity came out to be about over $727 million. That is employees that call in sick or they are not able to, produ to produce correctly while they are on the job or somebody else is trying to attend to them and help them. Um, in terms of how we divide our services for domestic violence and human trafficking, I would say about 80% of our work are the victim services that we provide uh, and their children. We are considered what is called dual agency. That means we work with victims, but we also work with the offender. And if you're wondering why do I care to work with an offender, is that they are somebody's brother. They are somebody's son. And more often than not, they've been hurt and that's why they are hurting other people. From a victim perspective, I know that while they are in our program, I know where they are. And I know that the victims are safe as a result of that. We also provide educational programs. We gotta do some prevention. Otherwise, we will always be dealing uh, with the intervention piece. And that's where we go into the schools. We teach young people about healthy relationships, how bullying is not supposed to be done. And, um, you know, something that I've been trying to work on from the human trafficking world as well is that, you know, when you're in school, they tell you that when a boy likes you, they are mean to you. To me, we need to start teaching young girls that someone that hurts you doesn't really care for you. So if you have daughters or granddaughters out there, that has kind of changed my world in looking at this, you know, very differently than I ever did before. We have created a model uh, of services that you could think of it like a safety net. Our whole goal for everything that we do is to remove barriers to services because everybody does not leave because of their own reasons, whatever that may be. I had actually a woman who is now a representative in Illinois who was an HR director and he had basically threatened her that if she ever laughed, she was going to kill their children. So she slept by her door every night to ensure that he wasn't going to get through. And that is a reality that many of our victims experience. So our goal is to try to provide a safety net with services. And we have identified about five categories primarily. So we have crisis and safety. That is when the event actually happens and they need to make a phone call, right? So that phone call happens and then we are there available 24 seven. We also have emergency shelter. Just so you'll know, uh, pre-COVID, we used to have about 33 clients a week or a night because that was our capacity. During COVID, we went up to 110 people a week. And unfortunately, we have not gone back on our numbers. We are still serving 110 people a week, not at the shelter because that's too small, but we've been able to place individuals at hotels. Uh, and that's how we've been able to manage those numbers. Um, we also have a legal advocacy program right in the courthouse where we have staff available to do the orders of protection, not only for domestic violence, but also for stalking uh, and uh, any other orders that may be needed. When we move down onto healing and building, we have really been developing transitional housing so individuals can then have a place to go. That is the number one need that clients have when they come to us. And then, of course, intervention. 
Post-separation, we actually have a family visitation center. That is where parents who does not have custody of their children are able to conduct visits there. We also provide therapeutic services all the way throughout. And then of course, you know, the prevention piece. Um, in terms of how people can get involved, there are many ways to do this. Um, there is definitely impact. Uh, what happens in Chicago also impacts us as well, because what happens with a victim when they are experiencing domestic violence, let's say in an area of Chicago or neighborhood, what you see occurring is that they want to get as far away as they can from the person that is hurting them. And usually staying in their community is not a viable option because they are afraid they're going to be found. So they basically will call us and then we'll be able to take them in as a result of that. Let me see here. So why should Cook County care? You know, we deliver as many services as some shelters do here in Cook County, except that they are located farther away so then victims can be safe and can be protected. Um, Cook County survivors want to be as far away as possible from their abuser, whether they are trafficked or not. Um, I'll give you an example. One of the first um, things that I saw when I started my job at a safe place, I went to the courthouse and I sat through to see what was happening. And here was an 80 year old woman who was shaking like a leaf, crying in tears. She had been found bitten and naked and chained to a pole by her 80 year old husband and she was found by her son. The father became so vindictive toward the son that he himself ended up having to get an order of protection, which we were able to help them with that. And, uh, but thank goodness today, she's doing great. She's spending the last years of her life happy with grandchildren not being hurt after being hurt so many years of her life like that. Uh, to give you some idea of our numbers, um, these are the main areas where our Cook County residents receive services from. You can see we have emergency shelter, about 104. That means 34% of those that come from Cook take advantage of our emergency shelter. About 53% take advantage of our counseling. And then we have about 21.7% of our housing. That's like transitional housing or permanent section eight. And then the rest are from orders of protections that they come and take advantage of. So in total, this is for our fiscal year 23, we provided over 4,000 hours of counseling to Cook County residents and over 16,000 nights of safe homes for residents of Cook County, serving over 400 people from this area. This is as much as you would have actually a shelter providing services here. We also provide services to children. And again, you can see in there how many came into emergency shelter, housing and counseling. You know, this work has kind of changed the way I look at the world when I'm in a conference room like this or in a theater. I always think about one out of every three, one out of every seven. So that tells me how big the need is in our country. It's just that unfortunately, domestic violence feeds in silence. And I wanna challenge you that when you leave today, you talk to others about it. You see something, say something, because there is a reason why you're feeling that way. Uh, in human trafficking world, I'll never forget, and it's interesting how this happens. These, there were these two young girls that were actually living in Puerto Rico, were promised jobs here. They were connected through Facebook. Can you believe? Well, of course, that's the way to do it. And they were brought over to our area. And uh, we were able to participate in a sting with the Lake County Sheriff's Department 
where they notify us we were on standby so then we would be able to be present once the arrest of the jams were made and of the uh, trafficker and then we were able to take the victims with us and then did a safety plan with them on how they would return home they had no idea. They saw that they were coming to work. They were brought into a house where they were told they would be bartenders. They get to the house. And of course they said, no, you got to go and work in that bed. And you know what they did? They used the Chicago cops W. Whenever somebody could come in, they would post the flag outside. So then more people would come in and then they would be used um, for sexual uh, satisfaction for them. So it is a big reality. It happens in our backyard without us even knowing that this is there. But what we are here for is it doesn't matter where you're from. It could be from Cook County or from any other area. We're here available to provide services. We do not uh, say you have to be from King County or from Lake to be to receive our services at all. One thing that I wanted to leave you with is our crisis line. If you know of anyone, uh, you know, 1-800-600-SAFE is our phone number. It is available 24 seven and it is with individuals that are trained and know how to handle, you know, the crisis calls. Um, the amount that we received in fiscal year 21 was almost 5,000 crisis line calls that we received. Uh, it was over 600% increase after we ended up, you know, having COVID. And I wanted to leave you with this. Uh, sometimes children are, we call them the forgotten voices of domestic violence and human trafficking. Sometimes they are trafficked themselves as well. But what we see occurring is children are just brought, right? Somebody has to leave, they come alone with you, and you leave, and they come alone with you. They have no voice, usually, whether they can go or not. We use art therapy as a modality to help a child bring out what is inside of them. And the one on the right is the one that gets to me the most, and I always like to, to share it with when I speak with people so they can understand a little about the trauma that children go through. And this child is a six-year-old who says, I am visiting my mom at the cemetery. I know someday he will kill her. This is a six-year-old child. And who would have thought that, right? That a child that age has to be worried about something like that. And we serve you know, kids as a result of it. So with that, I just wanted to say thank you for listening to me today, for being here. Uh, we left uh, a handout in the back that looks like this. And it's basically to show you our journey on how we started with a very humble beginnings and how we have grown over the years. Uh, we've been around for 45 years. We are not a fly-by-night you know, operation at all. And uh, we also left some brochures there too for you to have. Um, and also, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Do you have any questions? Yes, sir. Well, thank you for the um, great service that you offer to our community. If you had the wish list for 2024, mm -hmm. what's the one thing? That is a great question. And our board has actually been doing strategic planning. And out of that came that we want to create a shelter that will allow us to house 110 or 150 people that will be housed with dignity and respect. Our current facility is what is called communal. So that means you share bedrooms, you share bathrooms, you share a kitchen. In my own family, I can even have three people decide what show to watch on TV and they have one TV for 30 people. So a lot of times 
that is not the best environment for healing because people can trigger each other, right? So that is what our dream is, but it would have a behavioral health wing so then people can access services readily available along with a medical wing. Many times we deliver babies in our shelter or we get individuals that come in and are eight months pregnant and never receive prenatal care. So that medical wing would allow us to assess medically where they are at and connect them to services along with a pet shelter. Because many times people don't think about that, but if you have a pet, you won't leave your babies behind. And that's what happens with victims because they know that if they leave that pet behind, they're gonna take it out on that animal and they can kill them. So they won't leave without that animal at all. So that's our vision. We are right now conducting a feasibility study. And I'm glad you asked because I was gonna mention this. If anyone knows of land or building anywhere out there that is hot on your hands and you wanna get rid of it, uh, let us know, please, because we're looking for that. Um, given that we have not gone back to pre-COVID levels, the need is much greater, I think, than we ever realized it was. Thank you. Yes. Yes, actually we work with, um, so you're right, at the emergency shelter or the hotels, they can stay up to 90 days. So three months technically, but that is not enough time sometimes, you know, to be able to find housing. So what we have been doing is going aggressively after funding to build more housing programs because it's so much easier when they're already in house and we plug them in. However, we work with the continuum of care with the Lake County Health Department, where we're able to place people in rapid rehousing or transitional housing through them. And we have great relationships that allow us to do that. Um, but the next step, of course, is a job, right? Many of them have been kept captive, if you wanna say that, where they are not allowed to leave the house or ever work. So now they're on their own with no skills. So we've been working with workforce development and job service to help us find employment for them. We participate through all the different job firms in the community, either through the community colleges or all the opportunities that are available to help them. Many employers will send us job openings too, so then we can distribute among our clients and then they can go and apply as needed. Because self-sufficiency is our goal. You know, yes, we are here, we're supporting you, we're working with you, but you, don't, you know, we don't want you to need us forever. My, my goal and hope is that we will be out of business, right? Uh, it is unfortunate that we are needed, but I'm glad that we are here for those that do need it. Because it would be very difficult, but yes, absolutely. Collaboration, we always talk about teamwork makes a dream work from Martin Luther King, you know, because we know that we can do this alone. And if it wasn't for the collaboration and assistance that we have uh, from the community, we would not be able to do this at all. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes.
great question. And I'm going to have Damaris here because she had, she was the, before she came to be in the admin, she was with our legal advocacy program. Thank you so very much. Run from a slide. <laughs> oh, please. All right. So I would like to thank you for being here today, and we have a wonderful cup for you to have your morning coffee and some cookies that are made by Al's Cookie Mix. That's who we are, who I am supporting this year with our gifts. Al, Alvin Green started a cookie company for his son and his friends that are autistic. And so when they age out of the system of CPS system, he wanted them to be able to be self-sufficient and be able to work. So he started Al's Cookie Mix for his son, Aiden, who's in that picture. And I remember when Aiden was like six. So, <laughs> um, and so that they could have some, so that they had an option once they aged out of the CPS system. So that is Thank wonderful. You. And if Thank you, you use that QR code, you get 10% off. Awesome. Thank and it's you. awesome. You can make your own cookie mix. It starts off with a base, so you could put anything that you want in it. So my favorite one that she has is a double chocolate with pretzel cookie. <laughs> OK. All right, so thank you so much. And now we are going to induct some new members. So if Chris Fields and Jalen Leon and Andrew would like to come up, please. Lita. <clears throat> it is my great pleasure on behalf of the Board of Directors and members of the Rotary Club of Chicago to welcome you as a member of Rotary One. We welcome you not only for the fine fellowship that we shall share, but also for your talents, abilities, and enthusiasm that will help us carry out many projects to make our community, our country, and world a better place to live. Rotary is not a political organization, but all Rotarians are vitally concerned with everything pertaining to good citizenship and the election of good men and women to public office. Rotary is not a charitable organization, yet its activities exemplify the charity and the sacrifices that one should expect from people who believe that they have a responsibility to help others. Rotary is not a religious organization, but it is built on those eternal principles that have served as a moral compass for people throughout the ages. Rotary is an organization of businesses and professional people pledged to upholding the highest professional standards. Rotarians believe that worldwide fellowship and international peace can be achieved when business people unite under the banner of service. You all are already standing, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you have been chosen <clears throat> excuse me, for membership in the Rotary Club of Chicago because your fellow Rotarians believe you to be a leader in your profession and because you manifest the intelligence and commitment of heart that fit you to interpret and impart the message of Rotary. You are a representative of your profession in this club and any information of an educational value pertaining to that profession must come naturally to us through you. At the same time, you become an ambassador for us to your profession and we rely on you to carry the principles and ideas of service, which we here inspire to those who share your professional activity. The community will know and judge Rotary by your embodiment of it in the chapter, or sorry, in the character and service, 
and we accept you as a member because we know our principles and organization will be safe in your keeping. We also expect you to give us the inspiration that will help us become better Rotarians. And it is with this hope that I ask the president of the Rotary Club of Chicago, Alita, to invest you with a distinguishing pin of a Rotarian and gladly offer you, or I'm sorry, and gladly offer you the right hand of Rotary Fellowship. Thank you so much. Congratulations. And so if Chris would like to come up and just do a small introduction of yourself to the group. Yeah. Well, um, thank you everyone. Um, you know, my name is Chris Fields. I moved up about a year ago uh, and I was transferred from the Lakewood Ranch Club. So I went from the warm weather to the cold weather. Um, but I've been with Rotary about eight years. Um, I got to know Rotary in high school. Uh, I was playing basketball in Fort Myers and the Fort Myers Rotary Club actually had a student of the quarter Rotary scholarships, like $500. And so I won that twice. And I was always determined to, you know, give back whenever I could when I finished college. And so, um, you know, Rotary's become family, really excited to be in Chicagoland. Um, I'm a managing director at Raymond James and uh, looking to just, you know, do good things in Chicago. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I actually wrote down a few words, so I'll just uh, read those. Um, but it's a privilege and honor to stand before you um, as a new member of the Rotary Club of Chicago. Um, I want to express my deepest gratitude uh, for the welcome, uh, for welcoming me into this historic organization. I'm appreciative of the warmth and kindness you all have greeted me with. And as I begin my journey with Rotary One, I would like to take a moment to share where my passion from Ro for Rotary originates. I first became acquainted with Rotary um, through my involvement with, uh, <clears throat> sorry, through my involvement with the Interact Club, uh, which ignited my interest in community service. As a member of my Interact Club, I attended the Rotary Youth Leadership Awards Conference, or RILA, uh, a transformative experience that left an indelible mark on my life. RILA was not just a conference, it was a catalyst for self-discovery and growth. It taught me the importance of vulnerability and leadership the power of authenticity, and the courage to admit when you don't have all the answers. The values of Rotary, particularly the emphasis on service and fellowship, resonated deeply with me during this time. My early experiences with Rotary taught me the importance of taking bold, decisive action, action that challenges you at your core. I learned that true growth often lies just beyond our comfort zones. It's about pushing boundaries and embracing discomfort, as this is where real transformation occurs. Rotary, with its long history of impacting lives, exemplifies the spirit of bold and purposeful action. Today, I stand before you with great enthusiasm and eagerness to engage with the various communities and initiatives that our Rotary Club offers, particularly those serving and engaging with youth in our community. Our work with young leaders is a testament to Rotary's enduring commitment to nurturing the next generation. I'm excited to embark on this journey as a member of Rotary One I'm eager to serve, to learn, and to contribute to the legacy of this organization. Thank you. Thank you so much. We look forward to working with both of you as we move forward with Rotary. At this time, are there any visiting Rotarians in the room? You can, oh, I've got the microphone. Everyone for um, such great hospitality. This is, uh, I'm a part of the Rotary Club in Carroll Street, and I've only been at Rotary since April of last year, so I'm very, very new. Uh, but I brought a new, a potentially new member today to you guys uh, as a part of one of our initiatives that we have with Rotary Means Business. Uh, he's never heard about Rotary, Matthew Howard, and he wanted to see the experience, and I thought, what better, what better place to bring him than the place it all started? So thank you guys for everything, and you guys are awesome. Thank you. So in the interest of time, um, I'm going to 
let Patrick Burns introduce all of his guests today. <laughs> And you have one more? Thank you, Patrick, so much for bringing so many wonderful guests to this great speaker today. Um, do we have any visiting Rotarians on the Zoom? No? Awesome. So if you'd like to expand your business network <laughs> and serve the community, that is what Rotary is here for. And I would just like to say, if many people ask, why are you in Rotary and what can Rotary do for you and what that, what that means? Um, as a Rotarian, you know, it's a very old organization, so we kind of know what that means. And so, but with that, um, I have grown to have wonderful relationships in Rotary, and I've had wonderful business relationships in Rotary. And as we talk about COVID and the things that happened during COVID, I am a caterer and a chef by trade. So COVID obviously was not my friend since my whole existence is around groups of people coming together and eating my wonderful food. <laughs> but um, my Rotary Club decided we should feed the doctors in the medical district and came to me and said, Alita, we will pay you $10 a meal. All your food's good. We don't care what you cook, but we're gonna pay you to do the meals for the for the medical district. We did approximately anywhere between 200 to 300 meals a week for months. And without that, my network, my business network and my Rotary Club saved my business was the reason we stayed afloat. The reason we made it to get to the the fundraisers and to get to the all the other things that happened six or seven months down the line when people realized restaurants and things weren't gonna be open. Cause my club jumped on it quickly because we have club members who had family members that were in the hospitals and, and, were, and would be able to articulate to us how hard it was for them. And so that's why I say, you know, Rotary is more than just doing service in your community it can also do service in your own network and in your own group. And you have to, you don't have to be a part, but being a part helps. And we also do many th great things around the world. So that's my two cents on why. <laughs> Everyone should join Rotary. <laughs> um, enjoy your meeting. We have so many other meetings coming up that are great to be a part of. Uh, we have many volunteer opportunities every Wednesday. We can be at Cornerstone on 1111 North Wells. We help feed the homeless. I'm the chef there. Every, we feed anywhere between 150 to 200 meals every single weekend. So you can come from 2 to 5 and help me cook or from 5 to 7.30 and help us feed um, the people in the community. And we also deliver to some of the seniors um, around the corner that can't get out. And we have our Zone Institute this weekend. They are looking for volunteers. So if any of our wonderful Rotarians would like to volunteer for all the visiting Rotarians that are coming in from Thursday through Sunday, you know, that is a great opportunity. And if you can reach out to me or to Ose to get that information. This Saturday, we have a tour at the Haitian American Museum, Chicago tour, which is great. It's gonna be a wonderful um, tour 
that was done by our DEI committee. And we have a friendship exchange October 22nd through the 29th. We have some Rotarians coming in from Nigeria and they would love to be hosted by some members in the Rotary community here in Chicago. World Polio Day, we discussed this earlier, but these are our great events that could also, you can also register online at the website. Our community service committee has a scholarship for college applicants. It is open until November 30th. We're giving away $1,000 scholarships to service-based students. So please get that out there to anyone you may know that goes to school in the Chicago area proper. Sorry, we can't, we're not doing Lake County, but maybe in the future. <laughs> um, all the great work that we do in the community is because of the Rotary One Foundation and the Rotary Foundation for Rotary International. We can't do most of the work that we do without your donations to those organizations. And for our members, you can download the Ignite app and Andrew back there, raise your hand, can help you all do that. You can register for events, recruit new members, take service selfies, which are a lot of fun, and engage with other Rotarians. And scan the QR code for our gyrator that comes out every week. And if any of our guests would like to be on that list, please just let Sarah know in the back and she can make sure that you include it on our weekly emails. We have wonderful committees that are all looking for members and all of our wonderful dates and they are all on the calendar on wonderful meetings. I'm just gonna keep going. <laughs> Today is birthdays. We celebrate our birthdays once a month. Franklin, Jacqueline, Leba, and David, none of which could make it today, but happy birthday to you guys. <clears throat> and with that, I would like to invite my past president, <clears throat> Timo, up here to lead the four-way test. <clears throat> I like to volunteer people, as I've been told. <laughs> so if everyone could please stand. Where is it? What, you don't know? What, you don't know? Ladies and gentlemen, the four-way test. The, of the things we think, say, or do. Number one, is the truth. Number two, is it fair to all concerned? Number three. Will build goodwill and better friendships. And number four, will it be beneficial to all and concerned? And number five, will it be fun? Thanks. And lastly, as you see on the tables, there's this wonderful piggy banks on the tables. So today, any donations that are put into that piggy bank, we will give to a safe place. So please open your hearts and your wallets to give to them. And with that, I adjourn our meeting today.